So medieval Europe for centuries relied on a strict vertical social hierarchy where everyone was kind of fixed in their place on the ladder with no upwards or downwards social mobility. So if you were a peasant, you were a peasant for life. You can only interact with other peasants. You can only marry other peasants. You and your offspring could never move past that position of peasantry. And the same thing with everyone up the ladder, the priests, the lords, the knights, the king, they all had their ordained places. And then the king and the priests and the ones at the top of the hierarchy made stories to justify their superior position and to justify the peasants being in their lower position. Like according to them, this is everything in its right place. There's a natural divine order allegedly, and the king deserves to be at the top, and the peasants deserve to be at the bottom. And they're all told that to harden this hierarchy and keep it in place. And of course, they did this with their own discourse. So they had their own stories, usually religious stories, about the divine right of kings and the role of the peasants. And just like discourse we have today, it had its own array of elements. So the texts, the figures, the knowledge, the symbols, the garb that they each wore, so the peasants would obviously wear rags and be very dirty. And then the knights, lords, priests would each have their own colors to signify that position and their own robes and garb that they would wear to signify their social status. So during these times, during these uh, centuries, there were official feasts which were put on by the king or by the church or by a lord. And these feasts would reinforce the existing social order and further naturalize it. So those feasts were very orderly. Everyone was wearing clothing that represented their social status, their particular social role. The official feasts were another discursive mechanism for making that social hierarchy at the time seem like it was natural and unchanging and permanent and the tone of these official feasts was very overwhelmingly serious and there was no laughter in it so those were the official feasts but russian literary theorist mikhail bakhtin studied other medieval carnival festivals these weren't official festivities put on by the king or the church or lord they were thrown parties thrown by the people for the people. And these carnivals ran contrary to the official feast in that people didn't wear clothing that signified them as belonging to a certain social group or status. There was no like strict position at the table like, oh, you can't sit at the head of the table unless you're in this social position. That whole vertical hierarchy was temporarily flattened. These carnivals were just a mass of revelry and chaotic indulgence and ecstasy. So lots of feasts and dances and spectacles and games and all sorts of social festivities. And there was no distinction between people of different social groups, just identities and social distinctions between participants were dissolved and everyone just reveled in that collapse of meaning. And during these carnivals, there'd be a lot of laughter and notions of playfulness. And a lot of the shows and spectacles were comedic in nature. They could make impromptu theater shows that are like parodies or satire of the king. And this all precipitated carnivalesque humor or carnivalesque laughter. And it's humor and laughter that's universal in scope. It's the laughter of the people together collectively. Carnivalesque uh, is irreverent. It doesn't have the due respect for that vertical hierarchy that everyone is made to have. It points out and mocks the ridiculousness of those things we hold serious and natural. So the king and the lords and the church want you to take everything seriously, and the carnivalist just undermines that and serves to dissolve that vertical hierarchy. So the carnivalist challenges all that pretends to be serious and natural and permanent. And in those official feasts, everyone is separated. Everyone is compartmentalized. Whereas in the carnivals, everyone is together. They kind of form one mass. And during those moments, they recognize in themselves and in their in others the, the power that they hold as an individual and as a collective. It makes them aware of the power of the people as a unified social body and their ability to bring about the upending of the vertical hierarchy and the defeat 
of power and of kings. And they were proven to be right. The fact that this hierarchy doesn't exist anymore kind of hints that it was never natural to begin with. So we could argue that carnival still exists in forms today. The internet could be seen as one big carnival, especially uh, sites and forums where people are anonymous. It's similar to the carnivals of yore where they would wear carnival masks to hide their identities because the carnival isn't about social identity. It's about the dissolution of social identity. And for the internet, that could largely be considered similar in that regard. And there are all sorts of shows that are irreverent in that same way that are poking fun at the powers that be. I'd be curious to see if you could identify elements of the carnivalesque and other aspects of contemporary everyday life.